for those of you who um, are new and this is your very first time, a really warm welcome to you. It's it's great that you could um, join us today. And um, I know that uh, we're in for a real treat with John presenting today. Um, so my name's Sue Olovich and I'll be facilitating the session this afternoon. And I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land upon which I work and learn today. I'm on the land of the Darawal people and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. And I invite you, if you'd like to pop your, um, um, your name and, and introduce yourself in the chat, you might like to acknowledge the country that you're on today. And um, just a reminder to those of you who've joined for the first time, we uh, record the sessions and you um, we'll have them available for you afterwards if you're um, keen to rewatch um, on the Create Centre YouTube channel. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Saunders and John is currently employed by Griffith University where he teaches in the Bachelor and Master of Education degrees and he's in, been employed as an academic associate at Australian Catholic University and also as a sessional tutor with the University of Sydney. You've been around lots of places, John. And John's also been a guest lecturer at the University of New South Wales and Western Sydney University. And John's an honorary associate at the University of Sydney, where he completed his PhD, exploring the impact of drama-based pedagogy on English and literacy learning. And he's also co-authored the school drama book, uh, Drama, Literature and Literacy in the Creative Classroom with his esteemed colleague, Professor Emerita Robin Ewing. So John's presentation today um, is he's going to discuss some of the challenges, opportunities and strategies for managing multiple voices within arts and arts education research. And John's PhD research involved presenting a range of student and teacher voices through a study that employed qualitative data collection. And um, today we're really excited, John, because you're going to explore some strategies for researchers who may be considering presenting a range of voices within a study that respects participants' voice and allows for critical analysis. Um, so you're very welcome um, as you're listening to John, if you've got some wonderings, some curiosities, some questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or make a note of them. And we'll um, have an opportunity after you share, John, to perhaps unpack some of, of what you've shared with us this afternoon. So without any further ado, really warm welcome to, to John, really lovely to have you share with our group this afternoon. Thanks, Susan. Hi, everyone. It's so nice to be here this afternoon and so nice to see some uh, familiar faces that I haven't seen in uh, in quite some time. I wish you were all together uh, in person, um, but lovely to, to see you via Zoom this afternoon. Um, I'll share my screen. I've got a presentation to, to talk through, um, mainly to keep me on track um, this afternoon. There we go. I think that should be working. Um, something now of course there we go um, <clears throat> but if you've got any questions um, that you wanted to to flag or ask please feel free to um uh, to to raise them during and we'll have some time for questions at the end um, and i'm just going to put my timer on because i really could talk about my uh phd um from now until the cows come home. Um, so uh, um, um, the CREATE Centre um, suggested that I speak about an example of using multiple voices in arts education research. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about my PhD research and, and PhD journey as an example of that, um, which I finished uh, in 20. 19 uh, and graduated in 2020. Um, and I'd like to uh, also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm on, the Turrbal and Yagra peoples, and I pay my deep respect to elders um, past and present. And I also acknowledge um, the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation, um, who are the traditional custodians of the land on where uh, the land on which I conducted this research as well. Um, and I'd also like to um, acknowledge my supervisors on my PhD journey. Um, Professor Emerita Robin Ewing AM and Dr Victoria Campbell from the University of Sydney who uh, I really wouldn't have gotten through it without them um, and, and guided me um, very gently um, through, through that journey. <clears throat> 
the, the work that I did revolved around a program that I was involved with. Um, I was working for the Sydney Theatre Company at, uh, at the time um, and with Professor Robin Ewing, um, who was at the University of Sydney. Uh, and it was a program called School Drama. Uh, and it was a program that was developed by both the Sydney Theatre Company in partnership with the University of Sydney. And it used teaching artists or, um, or actors, um, drama educators to use drama rich pedagogical approaches, drama rich teaching tools, um, devices and strategies with quality children's literature to improve student literacy and student engagement. Um, and, and so much more. Uh, and it was based on the model of, of learning from Professor Ewing uh, on co-mentoring and co-teaching, um, where we paired a classroom teacher with a teaching artist and they would co-plan, co-mentor, and then co-teach seven weekly sessions over a term. Um, and it was really designed about building teacher confidence and teacher capacity and using drama uh, to improve student literacy and student engagement. Um, and a lot of the research that, um, that um, had been done into the program um, uh, had focused mainly on, on the, the impact on teachers. And I was quite interested on the, um, the impact on students. Um, it started in 2009 when Kate Blanchett and Andrew Upton were co-artistic directors of the Sydney Theatre Company um, and they worked with my predecessor um, Helen Rostovsky and Robin Ewing uh, to develop this program and it started off as a tiny little pilot uh, in 2009 and, uh, and today has reached over 35,000 teachers and students across Australia and New Zealand so it's kept growing um, during that time. So my PhD uh, research focused on that program and it built on my master's research in 2015. Uh, I went into that research thinking I'll just focus on the literacy outcomes um, of the students. So we um, looked uh, and what, what was sort of an unanticipated outcome was these, the, the students and the teacher in the class that I was working with kept talking about these non-academic, um, quote unquote, um, outcomes. And I sort of went, oh, well, I think these two are quite separate things. You know, I'm interested in the academic, not the, um, and not the non-academic. Um, and really uh, there was, I thought about this sort of dichotomy between the academic and non-academic. And what became clear is that that dichotomy was false. Um, and that made me curious to explore the relationship between what have been traditionally considered non-academic outcomes and their link to academic outcomes. So I looked at a multi-site case study analysis of student outcomes. There were three case studies that, um, that I looked at, and I looked at a year of the program in action in 2017. The question that I was really um, exploring was, what are the experiences and outcomes of students um, who are engaged in the school drama program? I won't go into the theoretical framework, but I'll, I will just say that uh, it was certainly informed by Vygotsky um, and uh, the sociocultural framework is, is uh, uh, really what resonated with me and my research, um, particularly the um, Vygotskyan concepts um, that are there, dual effect for uh, his work in creativity and imagination uh, play and of course um, the zone of proximal development um, as well. <clears throat> um, and Vygotsky I suppose describes sociocultural theory um, pertaining to education by saying that every function in the child's cultural development appears twice, first on the social level and later on the individual level, first between people and then inside the child. And I think that was really important to me um, in, in um, looking at sociocultural theory and, and thinking about the work of Godsby and thinking about how I honour um, the participants and their voice within the research. Within the case studies, I collected data from these three sort of dimensions. Um, the first was the teacher who was involved. So I worked with three different teachers at three different schools. I interviewed the teachers before the program began at different points throughout the program and also at, uh, at the end of the program. And then after I'd analyzed the data 
uh, about 12 months uh, after I had done the intervention, I came back, showed them the data and interviewed them again. So they were totally interviewed out by the end of uh, this process, but their voice was uh, really insightful. Um, I also worked with those students um, in those three classes, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail. Um, and we looked at pre and post programming um, benchmarking tasks in their literacy. So these were tasks connected to New South Wales um, curriculum outcomes um, on a scale, the teacher marked them. Uh, and um, we, we looked at the, um, the, the students did a piece of work in the very first week of the term and the very last week of the term of the intervention. We did a pre and a post survey with those students as well. Um, and if you take nothing else away from the session this afternoon, uh, the pre survey was 47 questions and the post survey was 62 questions. And that is, yes, Anna's face says it all. That is way too many questions. And everyone said to me, John, that's too many questions. And I said, no, it's a PhD, it's huge. Um, people said, you'll drown in data. I said, how can you drown in data? It turns out you can. Uh, so that was way too much um, uh, to have there. And the, the third um, aspect was uh, that I collected data um, because I was the researcher, but I was also the teacher artist in the classroom. So I was facilitating or co-facilitating with the classroom teacher these weekly workshops. Um, so I kept my observations and a research journal as well through that. So it was kind of an interesting um, interesting experience. So the voices, there were many voices. There were the three teachers that I was working with. There was the 76 students from year four, five and six. And my voice was also um, in there. And while it wasn't a socio, uh, wasn't a autoethnographic um, uh, piece, I also um, was really interested in this area of how drama uh, and embodied pedagogies can improve student literacy, really because of my own experience as a student. And there I am uh, as, a, as a primary school student who found learning to read and literacy really difficult. Um, I was really disengaged in primary school. I was diagnosed with attention deficit disorder um, and told that I had a, a learning disability and, um, and found school really challenging. And uh, School that schooling experience started to change for me when I discovered drama and the arts, and that started to become embedded in um, in the classes. Um, and so I think for me, the school drama program is a program I wish myself that I had of experience as a student. Um, and so those reflections are really interesting uh, as well. So there were a whole range of voices. Um, and, and I think I was very aware as well of the reason the reflexivity um, involved being the researcher um, and being the teaching artist in there and how to represent those range of voices um, within the research. <clears throat> the analysis um, focused on, uh, I really drew on Richardson's um, concept of crystallisation. Um, and I started with a thematic analysis of the student voices in the focus groups throughout, uh, and then the teacher voice. And uh, Richardson's um, crystallisation um, um, was further built on by uh, Adam St. Pierre in um, 2018 with Richardson. Um, and they explained that, um, I suppose, in, in triangulation, a researcher deploys different methods, interviews, um, census data, documents, and the like to validate findings. And these methods, however, carry the same domain assumptions, including the assumptions that there is a fixed point or an object that can be triangulated. Um, and in contrast, um, they argue for crystallization, employing the metaphor of the crystal, which they say, and I quote, combines uh, symmetry and substance with an infinite variety of shapes, substances, um, transmutations, multi-dimensionalities, uh, and angles of approach. Crystals grow, change, and are altered. They are not um, 
amorose uh, crystals are prisms that reflect externalities and refract within themselves, creating different colours, patterns and arrays, casting uh, off in different directions. What we see depends on our angle of repose, um, not triangulation, but rather crystallisation. So I thought it was going to be this beautiful, simple um, crystal. Uh, to look at in my analysis, uh, and uh, I think it actually was more like this cluster of crystals. It was so much more complex, and uh, and looking at the research and the data from a whole range of angles. But I found this idea of the crystal. I actually had a crystal on my um, uh, on, on my desk while I was uh, writing this to keep coming back to the idea of crystallization, which apparently. Um, if you're a crystal person, um, a crystal in front of an object amplifies the object. So it was actually amplifying, if you subscribe to that, amplifying the, uh, the, the, the laptop and the research at me, and it, which apparently is not a good thing. So just a side note there. Uh, this is an example of the benchmarking um, that the students did. So it's a, an A to E rubric based on syllabus outcomes and a range of criteria. And we use this 15 point scale of an A plus to an E minus to be able to look at the student work. So the students wrote a piece at the beginning and the end of, um, of that term. There were three sites, um, three very different schools, actually within a fairly small distance of each other. Um, and I'm using pseudonyms for them. Um, Waratah Grammar School, or Year 456, um, which is an independent school with an international focus. Um, quite an, a range of students spoke languages other than English um, at home. Um, but no students from that school identified as Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander. And the school fees were pretty expensive, um, ranging from $17,000 to uh, $25,000 a year. So it was. Um, a, one context that we looked at uh, in the research. Um, the second case study was at Gungallan Public School, um, a year five class, um, and um, a, a range of students that had language backgrounds other than English, um, and nine students or 34% of the class identified as being First Nations, um, which was really interesting and added a, a, quite a different dimension. Uh, this was a school in a fairly low socioeconomic area in Sydney. Uh, and the third um, case study, we, I looked at Wentworth Public School, uh, a year four, five composite class um, in Sydney's east, um, and uh, no students identified as being Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, four students had language backgrounds other than English. Um, this was a public school, but it was, uh, I suppose, a, a more mid-range public school uh, in Sydney. So those three schools. I'm going to focus on one case study, and that's the Waratah Grammar School, just as an example of how I've um, analysed the data and the outcomes, but also how I've used those multiple voices. So we measured the students' um, literacy at the beginning and the end of the, the seven weeks, so it's not a long time. Um, and the students did a piece of writing really focusing on inference and comprehension. So they were looking at a text or we explored a text that they had looked at last term uh, and they filled in a gap of silence or um, um, within that text with some written work uh, and that was analysed and then they did a similar a task at the end of the term. <clears throat> so you can see here, um, quite a significant shift in some of the student work. The blue bar is the pre-program task and the orange bar is the post-program task. And that green uh, horizontal line is that D minus cutoff there. So where, where we might consider a fail. Um, and when we look more, more deeply at the gender breakdown, we can also see that um, that male students are having a more significant shift over that period of time um, with their literacy focus, that we had a, a couple of female students um, who were already really high performing students. Um, no students went backwards. Um, and it was really the male students who we saw a, a, a significant shift in their inference and comprehension. What I tried to do, I was interested in the bar graphs and the pie graphs. 
but I really wanted to accompany those graphs with the richness that came out of the, um, the multiple voices that were a part of this research. So um, the teacher voice um, was, was really important because they were really a participant, but almost and a co-teacher throughout. Um, so their reflections and knowing their students obviously much better than uh, I ever will um, was really important. Um, so their, their reflections are pitted throughout um, the analysis of each of those three case studies. Here is an, an example of, um, I asked Dave from, from uh, one of the schools, um, uh, this was at the 12 months after I'd done the intervention about uh, whether he thought that, whether the shift that we saw in the previous slide was what he expected or whether it was more. Um, and he says, no, I think it's far more dramatic, pardon the pun, um, than what I would have expected. You see kids who are already scoring highly in these test scores to begin with, the pre-test, they are less likely to have much more growth. Uh, and that's the same for most pre and post testing because there's not as much growth. But seven weeks, to be honest, it's not a long time. But on average across the class, there's been quite a significant growth from the pre to post, um, more so than what I would uh, normally expect. And then I looked at the student's perception of that. And I think this is where um, I get, um, I, I, the student voice actually just shone through in the data um, and really had to be included. So, um, and, and as I mentioned before, it was from the survey, some of the open-ended questions in the survey, from the focus groups that were pitted throughout the um, data collection, um, and also some of the comments that were made during the classes as well that were recorded. <clears throat> um, I didn't know this at the time, but apparently what I did was called colour psychology, where I attributed um, to each of the students' names, I attributed a colour that I felt reflected that student. Uh, so I had to find 76 different colours um, that uh, would work for, uh, to represent those um, those voices, um, and I use those colours within the within the thesis um, to to represent, and I, I suppose to capture in some way some aspect of the student, as well as using uh, pseudonyms that I felt helped capture um, um, their personalities and perspectives. But I'll share with you the students' reflections on a on a question in a post survey was, "Do you feel like doing school drama has helped with your English and literacy? Why or why not?" And some of these, I, I just think, um, you know, for year four, five and six students to shine through, what really struck me was their ability to reflect on their own learning. Um, uh, Amanda, um, yes, because drama helps to relax me and to help my, uh, to help by making the activities more active and exciting. Genevieve says, I think it has, because even though you're not writing it, um, it gets in your mind, thinking that you can enhance your English and literacy. Josh says, yes, a lot, because we could approach it in a different way and it helped my imagination. Um, so there were these lovely um, comments from students and I found that the colours were really useful. Um, I think it was Michael Anderson's PhD, Professor Michael Anderson from the Sydney, from University of Sydney, um, use different fonts um, in his, which I found um, an interesting idea. The fonts I found annoying, um, but I loved the concept of it. And that really brought me to the use of those colours to try and manage the different voices. And through the, that crystallisation, that thematic analysis, um, I was able to really group together um, those, those um, consistencies, but also sort of looking at different perspectives the students had on different um, areas. So here's an example of <clears throat> a response. I learned better um, when we use drama in the classroom. This was on a Leichhardt scale of one to 10, um, one being strongly disagree, 10 being strongly agree. Um, you can see there uh, Roger giving it a one there uh, in, in bright red towards the, the end. Roger didn't participate in any of the focus groups. Uh, I don't know how it happened. I realised at the end when we were uh, doing it. Uh, Logan disagreed, a range of students there in the middle. Um, but uh, it was interesting to look at their, um, the students who, most of the students did participate in focus groups, um, their comments in reflection to, or in um, uh, 
uh, in connection with uh, the data that was um, coming from things like the, um, the survey data. Uh, questions like, I find it easier to write following drama sessions. Again, we're seeing that from Roger and Logan, but PJ and Kaya uh, are also joining in there. PJ is a really interesting student. PJ didn't like drama. He didn't like the experience. He talked about not liking it. I'm just going to show you his results, though. <clears throat> They're here, PJ. So in the pre-program, he received a D. Uh, and a rather extraordinary A uh, for the post program. So um, uh, a really extraordinary outcome, but he couldn't see, he didn't think that the experience had made any difference to him. He didn't like it um, and uh, he couldn't see the relevance of it. <clears throat> um, I also looked at student engagement and as you can see there, there are some similarities and some patterns with some of those students, dear Roger, PJ, this time Jackson uh, and some others as well, uh, not feeling that engagement. <laughs> but I think the student reflections were what really surprised me um, and, and, and really weaving them throughout the um, uh, each of the chapters focusing on um, uh, each case study and then the cross case study analysis as well. Uh, so I'll just give you a moment to maybe read uh, one or two of those. So <clears throat> this was, um, uh, clips from different focus groups um, from, from the, the students talking about uh, reflecting on their engagement and their shift in engagement. And you can probably hear too the difference between these comments that were made in a focus group to the previous comments that were made in the, um, uh, the typed um, post-program survey. So students talked a lot about their shift in engagement. And this is really where I thought it was going to be this quite nice, simple process of you know, we, we do this and this is the literacy outcome, but it's these things like student engagement, if we move on to collaboration was a really big um, uh, thing that students kept talking about. They're learning better by doing, they're learning better by collaborating from working with their peers connected to Vygotsky's own of proximal development. Um, and talking about things that uh, like why they would like to choose, work, work better in a group because um, they get lots of ideas from the people um, that they're working with and they have fun um, and, uh, and it validates lots of ideas. Um, empathy, emotion and connection to character was another outcome of the research. Um, and we looked at um, some of the questions for the pre and post. So again, the blue is the pre, the orange is the post. Um, when you read a book, how strong is that connection to a character that you feel? Um, which is really interesting. And again, if you uh, look at the, the, the gender analysis in that as well, it's quite, quite interesting. Um, and then uh, a post-program uh, question of, do you think you make stronger connections um, to the characters that were explored in the school drama program than when we read the book in class? Um, and it, um, so I looked at those pie graphs and what struck me, I suppose, as an early career researcher was the pie graphs tell one part of the story, but the student voice actually tells the real story. Um, and so it really was the combination of having perhaps a graph, which I love, um, and the analysis of really breaking it down with those student voices. Um, so things like Genevieve, um, I do because you act out the characters and you feel the connection as opposed to just reading and making assumptions. Amanda says, and yes, we do lots of different activities to do with the characters, and that really helps us step into their shoes. Uh, Caroline, as I said in the last question, uh, so this is from the survey, it helps us to see the characters in a new light. So I, I found those voices of the participants um, actually added so much richness to, um, to I suppose, the more... Um, quantitative aspects of, even though it's all in the qualitative paradigm, the more quantitative aspects, I suppose, of the research um, with that survey data. I know I'm, I'm creeping up on time, so I'll just um, uh, keep flicking. Um, um, I, students talked about their change the way they think about drama. Roger didn't. Um, again, dear Roger. Uh, but uh, many students did. There we've seen that pattern. 
and the drama has helped me see the world through different people's eyes or taking on different perspectives. So looking at that um, analysis of character, again, we're seeing a pattern there as well. Um, student confidence was something that came out of the research. The students kept talking throughout the research process. And I think this was the joy. I, um, I um, led those focus groups. So I was the co-teacher, I suppose, the teaching artist. Uh, we'd have those focus groups immediately following some of those workshops, then we'd interview the teacher, and I transcribed all of the interviews myself, which at the time I thought was really annoying, uh, and in hindsight I loved and really helped me to have a relationship with the data. Um, and I, um, I transcribed them as I went, so I was able to sort of take a moment to step back and really reflect, and student confidence was one of these um, themes that kept coming up from students in, um, in, in many of the focus groups. So there was a question in a survey, uh, I feel more confident after using, uh, I feel more confident after the school drama program um, and students talking about confidence. I feel, I think I feel more confident in speaking and writing and sharing my ideas actually in everything I do. Um, so again, that student voice. Imagination was something that also came up in the research. Um, students feeling more confident in sharing their ideas with the class. Um, I didn't actually explore imagination in the survey data, um, but, but a student like Chase made some brilliant comments. So I think this was also the other thing that struck me is that even though I had so many questions in the survey, it didn't allow actually for me to capture everything. And there were aspects that I missed in the survey. Um, one of them was imagination and the students talked about imagination a lot. Um, and Chase's comment, I think, sort of captures that view. And, and I think that's why the, the student voice is so important. Well, I think like what I said before in class, that you have like an imagination switch that you can just turn it on or off. But normally if you're doing a persuasive text or something like that, or persuading someone, your imagination just turns off. Um, but when you were doing drama, you get to think and you get to imagine what other people feel like or what they um, do. And that like clicks it on in a way. So I think that, that uh, again, just sort of captures the, um, the voice of, of those students. So the, out of the research, um, what I found um, consistently across those three case studies was that there was shifts in literacy, in comprehension and inference, particularly in male students. Um, there were shifts in engagement through embodiment. The drama helped activate student imagination and learning was um, really collaboratively um, constructed um, through the collective zone of proximal development and that students develop confidence throughout the process. Uh, however, there was always a couple of students in each um, of the studies who didn't believe that drama had helped them in any way. I did a cross um, study of the anal analysis, which I won't go into, but I will share this. This was sort of the inputs and outcomes of all the case studies. Um, and I, I called this the symphony. So I was drawing on the work of Pink and using the metaphor of the symphony to bring these elements together. And Pink argues that for a symphony, not analysis, but synthesis, seeing the big picture, crossing boundaries and being able to combine disparate pieces into uh, an arresting new whole. And this, um, this model, I think, reflects the mess uh, that is um, working classrooms, that I thought these were going to be very separate. You put in emotion, for example, um, there's empathy developed and it connects to character. Um, and that is true, but actually it overlaps with all of the other things that are happening in the classroom. It doesn't sit nicely by itself. Um, another input was the embodied nature of drama learning um, that crosses over through collaboration, through the aesthetic, through emotion, and that actually improves student engagement. But students work collaboratively. That crosses through everything else, but that developed um, learning through a collective zone of proximal development and that there was the engagement that learning through the aesthetic experience of drama that uh, increased student imagination. 
I just thought I'd share um, a, a slide. Um, this is just a clip from the um, from the PhD thesis, which is just really part of a conversation, um, a, an interview conversation with one of the students and myself. So, um, so really, it was you know really about honouring the multiple voices that were in the the research, um, including my own. I think um, without tooting my own horn. So I'll stop there. I realise that I have gone on for half an hour. Uh, I could keep going, uh, but I will leave it there. Oh, John, you could keep going for another hour longer and we'd still uh, we'd be sitting on the edge of our chair. Um, John, thank you so much. What an inspiring um, presentation, but such um, such interesting aspects that you shared. I loved um, the way that, uh, you know, being true to, to the way that you approached your PhD in, in with that focus on voice. I could see so many of the students that you were um, talking about there. They were coming into my mind um, with their with their own voices, and I love the the examples that you shared. Um, I know that um, a number of you popped on some little comments in the chat there. Feel free, Pauline and Katrina, if you'd like to um, to draw on any of that or or to ask a, a question. Um, of John. I know that um, both Pauline and Katrina um, commented upon um, your own um, experience as a student and bringing um, that experience into, um, into your um, perspective um, during the PhD. Um, I don't know whether um, Pauline or Katrina you'd like to, to add to that or if you have a, another um, wondering or curiosity. Um, I will make a comment. Um, I think it's an interesting choice. Hi, John, by the way. Hi, Pauline. Nice to see you, Eva. Lovely to see you too. Room. Yes. Um, it's a good idea to use your own voice and your own voice as a child to thresh out how kids are feeling in a classroom. Um, and I wonder actually how many teachers themselves were dis disengaged children um, in classrooms of all sorts, not just... Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a bit old to have had drama as a subject at school, but, um, and I was an engaged student and I was a capable student. So that makes a difference, we know. But using your voice, I think, um, and, and thinking back to how you felt as a child and leading that to inform the way you drew your data out, I think is a great idea. So mm. congratulations on that. Thanks, Pauline. I think it um, it almost happened, but really by accident through through a conversation with my supervisors and mm. sharing a part of my journey, really. Um, and they were like, "This actually sort of frames, you know, um, frames where you're going." Um, and so the first chapter, I think I had just read "Becoming" by um, um, by Michelle Obama. Um, and the first chapter, I sort of went, actually, we are all becoming, we never become. Um, and I loved that idea um, and borrowed a little bit of Michelle Obama um, uh, in there. Um, and it was sort of becoming a, becoming a student, becoming a learner, mm -hmm. uh, then becoming a, a, a teacher and then becoming a researcher really. Um, and that journey, but also having the same, you know, you just keep building the experiences that keep adding the experience. Um, but I think those, our own schooling experiences, I think really do um, frame um, work that we do, how we approach um, our, our own teaching and certainly I think our research as well, our curiosities, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's probably worth always holding on to that um, vision of ourselves as students as well mm -hmm. uh, because it, it pro that's probably what made us teachers and interested in education and research and data and, um, but yeah, so good on you. I like Thank that you. idea. Thanks, for that. Yeah, hi, John. Um, hi, Katrina. How are you? <laughs> Real good. Hanging That's in there. Um, yeah, I, I think that is such an important um, connection to make um, between yourself as a, as a young learner uh, when you're either working in schools or researching in schools, but because then you can examine your preconceptions about education and you know your experiences shaped your view and and that's something that um 
I think as a as a teacher, it's really important to keep reflecting back on in terms of, well, are you connecting with your students um, in in ways that sort of help them grow um, as people as well as as you know academic learners, and um, you know you situate yourself in the classroom as a researcher if you're doing classroom based research. Um, again, you have to sort of think, well, what am I already assuming about this situation and these children and, and what's happening here in this classroom? Um, you know, and, and examine once again, those preconceptions. Uh, and, you know, I try to make that sort of um, upfront and apparent in, in my writing, um, PhD writing. Um, you know, keep referring back to that because that's that can be your researcher bias or whatever. <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's I think why that reflexivity is so important, especially mm. when I was the the researcher and the teaching artist in that classroom, um, mm. and acknowledging it and balancing it, um, and going, I'm wearing dual hats uh, it's the crystal again I think it's just such a powerful kind of metaphor um, you can look at it from you know from the teaching artist angle you can look at it from the teacher angle you can look at it from your own sort of lived experience angle as well it's um yeah I just found that a really useful um concept mm. yeah absolutely and and then of course there's how the um teacher in the classroom sees you as a researcher and, and how they position you in relation to the class and, and what you can do with their children, you know, their children. Yeah. <laughs> you know. So it's, it's complex. It's interesting. It is. It's a cluster. It really is that cluster of, of, um, of, of crystals together, I think, and, and trying to make Absolutely. sense. Yeah, of yeah, that was a great metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> John, I've got a, a, a wondering actually. I'm I'm curious. You were talking about reflexivity, and I was thinking about the um, reflexivity of each of your your, your um, case study schools. And I was wondering whether the drama program looked quite different in each of those settings in the way that it was delivered with your um, co-teacher, or yeah. was, was there a, a high degree of similarity in the way that you approached the the um, the drama program? It's a great question, Susan. Um, we use different texts at each of the schools. So we use a picture book um, or two picture books in one school. Um, and we read it in this sort of episodic manner. So we might just look at the front cover in the first lesson um, and do some drama around it. And we're using these drama strategies. Um, um, you know, uh, hot seating the character and stepping into their shoes or um, creating a frozen image and predicting what might happen next. Um, so they're all connected to, um, to really inference and comprehension um, uh, and digging deeper into the, the story, filling the gaps and silences. Um, so the strategies that we use were the same in, in the three um, contexts, the texts, the stimulus text, I suppose, that uh, were different in each of the contexts. Um, and I think the co-teaching, I'd worked with the three teachers before um, in, a, in a previous, you know, previous years um, while working on the program. And they were very different teachers, very different um, levels of experience in drama, um, uh, you know, each fantastic um, but, but very different. Um, and I think, you know, as a co-teacher in that space, you're also in their world, in their space, in, on their territory. Um, so I think it does change in the, there are things that are consistent and there are also things that, um, that are unique to each of those contexts. And of course, what the students are like as well is um, how they respond. Um, they were all co-ed schools, they were all three primary schools, um, but one was a four, five, one was a five, and one was a five, six. Um, and um, and different different levels of ability within those classes, different backgrounds. Um, yeah, so it is, it's um, sort of, yes, I, I suppose that's why the case study kind of really worked, because um, mm -hmm. you were sort of looking at the, you know, at what, 
it can't be replicated. Um, um, yeah, yeah. Um, there are similarities across them that we can take and reuse some of those, lots of the teaching strategies, but the actual context is um, just that moment in time. Mm, beautiful. Thanks, John. Thank um, over to anyone else, if you, we're only a small group today, so if anyone would like to just unmute and ask a question, or if you've got a question you'd like to pop into the chat, feel free while we've got John here. Such an interesting presentation, John, so enjoyed it. Thank you. I always think everyone thinks their PhD is fascinating, <laughs> but, but I hear other people talking, I'm like, oh. <laughs> so thank you. I, I, even if you're being very polite, I'm very glad. <laughs> <laughs> or it might resonate, resonate or bring up a question from, from okay. I know we've got some fabulous researchers here as well um, with, with, with the work that you're doing as well. Mm. Any questions from anyone? Any further? Oh, good on you, Lauren. <laughs> um, I was just wondering what uh, long-term implications does your research have for this drama program? Yeah. Um, we used the research, really, it was the beginning of us looking at the student um, outcomes. And we did more, um, we used it, I suppose, and then did an independent analysis um, with an academic from, or two academics from Sydney University, looking at the outcomes um, in following years um, after I had done the, the PhD study, not to the same level of, of depth, and it certainly didn't include the student voice in the way that the PhD did. Um, so it sort of um, really marked, uh, I, I think really marked a maturing of the program and of us being able to articulate um, the what was consistent in the program, what were the sort of, um, the, the student outcomes and what we were able to see in a whole range of different contexts um, um, with the student um, student shifts in literacy. We looked, um, the program looked at four different literacy areas. So I only looked at inference and comprehension, but we also looked at descriptive language and vocabulary, um, confidence and oracy. Um, And there's one more that's left my brain this afternoon. Um, and what we found that there was, um, we saw similar shifts, um, no matter whether it was working with the kindy class or a year six class, no matter whether it was working with an outcome focused on um, inference and comprehension or descriptive language or confidence in RSE, that we generally saw a fairly consistent shift in student learning um, over that short period of time. Um, so that really helped us, I think, justify the program, um, particularly when you're talking about arts-based interventions in schools, and this is framed as a professional learning program for, for teachers. Mm. That's awesome. It, I haven't heard of the program before. I'm assuming it's not in all primary schools? No, it's not. And it's a... Um, it has been in the past heavily subsidised through a whole range of philanthropic funders. Um, so schools make a small contribution um, to it. Um, some schools are completely subsidised if they're um, disadvantaged. Um, uh, um, and mainly in public schools, actually, in, uh, in New South Wales, um, mainly in Sydney. But there are sort of satellites of the program in places like Aubrey Wodonga, um, uh, where else? Uh, Darwin, Western Australia, um, the ACT, um, and then versions of it running um, in the past, pre-COVID in Queensland, in New South Wales, um, South Australia, uh, and over the ditch in New Zealand as well. Um, but it is, um, while it's big for an arts program, it certainly doesn't have the funding that, um, that lots of our um, lots of other programs I suppose do, and it certainly doesn't have that commercial kind of focus, I guess, as well. Mm. Oh, that's awesome. You just need to work STEM into the name of it and then it'll get plenty of funding. Well, it's funny that the non-academic outcomes, the, the sort of student confidence, imagination, um, communication, creativity, I think are, are, are really what STEM learning is all about. Um, so I, 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 think you're, I think you're under something there, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that question, Lauren. Um, any other comments or, or questions that anyone would like to, to add? 
was just going to ask, um, did any of the parents like recall report back to you with anything like the changes outside of the school, like that their behaviour changed a lot after they left the school environment or anything like that? Or? No, look, that's a great, mm. I, um, um, I had thought about um, talking to parents and interviewing parents um, and um, I kept getting advice that the, to, to narrow the scope of the research. Mm -hmm. um, so if I did more research, that is something I'd be really interested in, um, particularly long term. This was just an intervention over one term, um, but I'd be really interested to, to interview parents um, um, and do some research to see what they noticed as well. Um, but, but, uh, but I didn't for this, um, for the PhD. No, no, it's interesting. I mean, the timing is everything too. You're lucky you got to do it when you did. I mean, look yes. what's happened since. So, so good. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think that's right. I think, um, I think I, I lent on the, because the teachers, because the teacher, uh, the first case study started in term two. So they'd had a, a, a term of working with their students before I began research. Um, so I worked in term two, term three, and term four with each of the, um, with, you know, one site each term. Um, so I really relied on the teacher knowing the students mm. and be able to talk about what they were like sort of outside of that context um, as learners and as people as well. You know, the, that they talked about shifts in, students collaboration and being able to work with different groups that it became easier for them um, you know and they were got tying that to in drama because they're um, uh, working with different students at uh, different peers all the time whether it's for 30 seconds or for you know 20 minutes um, and that, that was sort of um, seeping into the everyday kind of um, routine of the classroom so it was in that yeah I, I guess I relied on the teacher voice in, in Mm -hmm. Some of the comments of those children were just so articulate. Their language, my goodness, yeah. I don't remember ever speaking like that. I mean, and I've no. grown up watching theatre forever, but just their language, the way they worded things, was just beautiful. Yes. And that's going to hold them in good stead for the future, I'm sure, whatever they decide to do. So yeah. it's great. Uh, it absolutely struck me, Natasha, as well. I had been a secondary teacher and, and worked on this program in primary. Um, and it was actually through the masters that I did that the students with the student voice was starting to come up there and there and I was thinking how how, how I've really never sat down and asked my students about their learning and what they're taking away from it in in small groups in focus groups on a deep level uh, and interrogating it and it was just fascinating and surprising mm. for me to see um, students talking about it and being able to reflect um, like that yeah I, I, mm. I totally agree and just adding on to, to Natasha's lovely comment there about the students, um, I guess in, in summing up, um, John, one of my takeaways is, is Chase's beautiful comment about imagination. And I think, um, you know, to, to draw on his voice, you've, um, you've um, wet our and stimulated our imagination in your presentation this afternoon and um, given us lots of food for thought and um, really contributed to a beautiful discussion this afternoon where we've really, um, it's been so insightful. So um, can you join me now in thanking John for his really brilliant presentation this afternoon? Really enjoyable. And um, what a lovely discussion that we were able to, to have afterwards as well. So thank you so much for taking the time this afternoon to share with, with our group. And thank you to those of you who've been able to come along um, this afternoon. For those of you who it's your first time, you're always very welcome to, um, to join our CREATE sessions on a Thursday afternoon. Um, our next session is actually going to be in um, just on a month's time. So Thursday, the 13th of October, we normally have them fortnightly but we're having just a little bit of a, a, a break and then we're going to have a couple that are going to run on a weekly basis um, and Professor Pat Thompson for those of you who've um, undertaken a PhD or doing one at the moment you probably know Pat um, from her Patter blog um, that she she writes that supports um, early career researchers and PhD students um, it's going to be held at a slightly later time because Pat's in the UK so to coordinate the um, the timing it will be Thursday the 13th of October at 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. So you'd be more than welcome to, to come along to that. She's going to be um, presenting on researching with children's voice. Um, so mm. any of you are very welcome to, to come along to that one. Um, and we have some wonderful ones coming up after, after that as well. 
Um, so if there aren't any further um, comments or, or noticings or wonderings, um, I'd like to thank you all for coming today. Particular thanks to, to John for presenting. What a wonderful session. Um, we hope that you might be able to come back and, and join us at, um, at another stage. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Thanks, everyone. It's been a, a real joy. Thank you.